Everybody in this day and age has heard of Godzilla. First film released in 1954, 68 years and 32 more movies later, and here we are with one of the most iconic monster film franchises the world has to offer. How scary, however, did these movies truly ever get? And were they even meant to be scary? Was it a case where at film's release, people were petrified? Yet when the people of today watch, it's like, come on, who could be scared of this? My first introduction to Godzilla would more than likely be the 1998 version that when looked back is a very, very flawed flick, but it certainly holds nostalgia in my soul. After that, I really wasn't into Godzilla a whole bunch. I suppose this could go hand in hand with the fact that this was right around the bigger gaps in Godzilla film release dates, a whopping 10 years between movies. I'm sure there were other Godzilla mediums out there being released, but little me wasn't noticing them. Obviously, the Godzilla vs. Kong movie was enough to bring me to theaters, but the last two didn't. My main complaint about the modern films is that they focus on humans too much. Well, I, I guess I should clarify. They focus on really boring humans and don't show the monsters at all, really. I get that these movies tend to go for more of that horror element of making the monster hard to see, but I do feel in these films, you need to just let them go all out. Which I'm actually glad they did in Godzilla vs. Kong, even if that movie was less tense than the others. However, we are not here to talk about the live-action Godzilla movies but another recommendation from all you crazy people on another type of Godzilla content. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it appears that analog horror has spread even further beyond what I thought was even imaginable. Yet here we are. I have a feeling this is going to be in the same realm as Jurassic Park analog horror, but we will have to see as I have some faith for the two series I have planned to check out here. I honestly have no idea what to expect going into these, so without further ado, let's put on our adult diapers and head out into the unknown. Before I let you get too far, just wanted to say if you like what you're watching and are new here, it would help us out a ton if you hit all those nice buttons down below. I also have linked in the description our Instagram and Letterboxd, where I post some movie reviews I wouldn't post here. Alright, now you can pass through. The Man in the Suit by Unknowingly is our first series that we will be covering, starting us off with Godzilla Suit Incident, 1954, our first entry. Our first frame shows us the man himself standing near or on top of some bridge causing absolute chaos as flames spread around him. After that image, however, we learn the true nature of the story. I was pretty shocked, because I guess I was expecting it to be an in-universe Godzilla experience, but not with this one. We are taken into the behind-the-scenes world of this film set, hence the series title. I don't know about you, but the revelation that this story was going to be about the actor inside the suit they used for filming the movie piqued my interest way higher than I thought they could get. Analog Horror is proceeding to do what it does best, and adds that level of personal realism that scares me pretty good. After getting the job to wear and play the Godzilla costume, he fell in love with the suit. Quotes from movie producers tell us he would wear the suit most of the time, to the point that you never saw his actual face, and we learn from the co-director that he would go so far as to just wear the suit home, even when explicitly told not to. This would be as if Jim Carrey decided to really hone in on his Grinch role and just live the rest of his days in all that dreadful makeup. Apparently his last day on set wasn't a very good one. He stopped in the middle of a take and held still for several minutes before taking a couple steps, before stopping once more. Thinking it was a joke, the director kept prodding at the suit to get him to move. Except this guy was not budging. After understandable concerns, the director had people begin to take the suit off to check on the guy, only to be met with quite the disturbing sight. According to this, the actor began to grow into the costume. As they were pulling away at the costume to which the actor would normally climb out from, they realized all they were now doing was cutting away at his skin. The suit and the actor became one. We get a nice little diagram that visually explains the circumstance to us. Near the beginning of this entry, we are met with a frame with Japanese text that translates roughly to, Godzilla may be a monster, but I wonder if it's natural for me to be in the body of this giant, so I can become one with him. I'm very, very curious to see the direction this story goes, because as of right now, I have no guesses. I wonder if it's the suit itself that was causing the actor to go through what he did, or if the actor himself was just super Godzilla crazy and fate had its way with him. Only way to tell is to keep watching. Anguirus Suit Incident, 1955. Our second entry here has a set in the following year, after watching what looks to be a trailer for Godzilla Raids again. We cut to more text informing us of what went down after our first entry. We learn that the man who got fused into the suit actually returned to shoot the sequel, 
The producers knew they would have been sued up the ass if the public learned about this incident with the suit. They would be even more shocked to hear that they kept it and used it for the sequel. According to doctors, however, the actor had ingested some type of drug that made his skin and flesh inflate inside of the suit. At the end, the suit became his skin. He's basically Godzilla, which is, I feel like, what this guy wanted. The next unsettling reveal we get is that the eyes you see on the Godzilla suit aren't fake eyes anymore. They are now just the actor's horrifically bloodshot eyes peeking out through the head. We then begin to learn about the person who played Anguirus in the movie. Clearly like anybody else would be, the actor was a bit put off by the Godzilla suit man, and it doesn't seem like anybody cared to inform him of what he actually was. Luckily, it seemed as if the Godzilla suit man wasn't a hassle on set as he was described as very cooperative and could even now just make the animal noises on his own, you know, given how his vocal cords have been lost. Yet things would stop being so fine and dandy once the final fight sequence had to be filmed. It honestly gives a very interesting backstory to watching these Godzilla scenes. To think about it as an actor in a suit fighting some weird suit flesh hybrid body horror creation kind of makes it a little funny to watch them fling themselves at each other. Goofiness doesn't last long, however, as our Godzilla suit man goes off script and bites into the Anguirus actor's head. You would think he would be dead. Any crew that would try to come close to the actor were then met with a very defensive Godzilla suit man who protected the unconscious actor. Once the actor woke up from within the suit, the crew came close and were able to try and help him out. Unfortunately for this actor, it looks like Anguirus is his new form, as he too has been completely fused to the costume. We get another little visual to show us how it probably looks. So I'm now very curious as to how this whole thing works. How fast does a human morph with his suit? Did Godzilla suit man do this? I have many questions that I hope I get answers to. Before we move on, there was another frame hidden within this entry, this image right here, that I have no idea what to make of. But perhaps it will mean something later on our journey. Godzilla Encounter, 1962. We begin with a very recognizable trailer for 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla. After we hang on that for a while, we are met with the poster for the movie, and we learn that once again, the Godzilla suit man was used for this film. Apparently, it's the only Godzilla suit they have. Unfortunately, our Godzilla suit man is not a very big fan of Americans, and if you look at the time period and if you translate the description of this video, you would understand why. We were supposed to make a movie about what happened, about what they did, what they did to my family, what they did to me. Oh, filthy traitors. I didn't pour my soul into this carcass to be entertained, and with those who killed my family. Betrayer. It's clear now more than ever that the man that Godzilla suit man was before the whole incident lost his family due to the atomic bombings, whether it be a direct result or so be it. He now has a vendetta against the Americans. So working with them on this film made him go a little ape shit. <laughs> get it? Oh brother, this guy stinks! We actually get to meet our main character, or at least our source character of this analog horror series, the cameraman for King Kong vs. Godzilla. They informed him of the Godzilla suit man incident, but not the Anguirus actor. Maybe they learned their lesson. It doesn't seem like they told our King Kong actor though, so maybe they haven't learned any lessons. We learned that the Godzilla suit man had a bad dislike towards the King Kong actor. It's rumored that the cause is him being seen as a tra- What? It's rumored that the cause is him being seen as a traitor for portraying an American monster. According to our cameraman, he would roar and try to attack the Americans on set, and he was treated like a lion in the zoo. I'm sorry, but after two movie instances of this guy being an utter problem, I don't think I feel bad for this director anymore for having to deal with this calamity. Once again, on the final scene they had to shoot for this film, things did not go according to plan in the slightest. We get to see this final fight, and if I'm being honest, I know I said watching these movie scenes with this analog horror scenario as background knowledge makes it a little goofy, but during the scene, it started to become more tense. Tense as in I didn't know what would happen to this poor King Kong actor in this world who is just doing their job and has to wrestle this suit creature that's out for blood. Apparently, tumbling off the cliff was off script and was a deliberate act on Godzilla suit man to take out the King Kong actor. Our cameraman filmed it all as he described to us their fight in the sea, only for one to make it out. I find this part very interesting because it goes back to a more creepypasta route, where a lot of the horror is in the stories you are reading. We see the image of our Godzilla suit man rising from the water before an incident backstage occurs. We read about our cameraman trying to get some fresh air outside the studio, only for him to hear screams coming from the room he had just left. The power goes out, and using his camera flash, he captures a photo of whomever was approaching him from the dark, thought to be an employee, but revealed to be Godzilla suit man. I truly wonder where this series is going to go from here. 
I can't imagine each episode will be a rinse and repeat scenario of these people continuing to use this maniac in the costume in these movies, as every time it results in an incident. Depiction of Growth, 1962. This entry takes us to what seems right after the last, with our camera guy telling us that his first encounter with Godzilla Suitman left him incredibly curious. And although it is definitely dangerous, he is going to need answers. We are introduced to a new character that he gives the alias Alisa, who is said to probably know a bit more of this sort of ordeal. Except, as expected, she has never seen anything quite like this. After this, we listen in on a recording of a section of the phone call they had. Remember earlier when doctors had claimed he had ingested something? Well, this lady isn't so sure about that at least in the way we had originally guessed. She says that it isn't a pill that would cause this, but straight up radiation. She proceeds to use a pretty funny cream cheese donut analogy to explain that this radiation, wherever it is coming from, explodes the human body inside the suit, to which the body molds itself to the shape of the suit, to then start to fuse together, man and suit as one. Over time, however, the animalistic qualities will start to grow. She points out that human eyes don't reflect back like they do in the photo our camera guy got of him. When asked what he would look like in its final stage, she corrects him and explains that there is no final stage. The mutation will continue on forever. We are then presented with an artist's illustration of what the late stages of this transformation will look like, and well I'll be, it looks like Godzilla himself has entered the scene. I especially like the second photo here. Suit Trial 1958 This one is a bit hard to make out, but we will try our best here. We open up on what looks like a research tape being used to run some tests on our Godzilla suit man. The Japanese audio in the back translates to, We are fully aware of the situation we are in. We will do our best to test what they need to hear so that they can listen. We will try and do some audio tests. It is then revealed that they have Godzilla suit man locked away in a cell, and he is to remain there until they are able to train him. Looks like they finally came to their senses, kind of. I say, that poor actor seemed like he really wanted to be fused with the suit and it might just be best to take him out. But these studios want to milk this guy out for as much as he is worth. There's some audio clips playing in the back as we look through this old camera footage. First thing we are met with, I am not too sure what it is, but there are some recognizable Oppenheimer quotes being heard in the back. I can only imagine what his voice is doing here. All of this before the pretty unsettling final frame of this entry, where from the darkness, Godzilla Suitman slowly creeps towards the camera. Mailed Message, 1962 This entry is on the shorter end as we are just viewing a tape sent to our cameraman protagonist that doesn't seem to be from any producers, so God only knows who this tape could be from. It's clear this tape is from our Godzilla suit man, and we actually get some pretty tragic reveals on his motivation. He and his family lived in Hiroshima, and while he was off on a business trip elsewhere, a not-so-friendly visitor came to the city to give its warm welcome. Which this was already a theorized motivation back in the King Kong video, where we are introduced to Godzilla suit man's hatred towards the Americans. But it is nice to get that final confirmation from the man himself. Technically, since this all started during the filming of the first movie, Godzilla has been a real-life entity the entire time as his suit molding issue gets created alongside the movie's character. He says that he is going to bring back peace by getting rid of the people who wronged them. The final frame of this entry lands on an open mouth silhouette of Godzilla Suitman, as you can see the peering eyes and the honestly horrifying gaping mouth with what looks like a randomized array of teeth. Dorsal Extraction, 1962 it appears our protagonist is continually getting more shady mail as this entry starts with him getting two more sets. They came from the movie producers, but he describes the mail as looking unprofessional. One was how nobody at the company sent him that original package in the last entry, and the second was letting him know he was fired for allegedly telling people that they had sent him the tape. He admits to doing so right after. All hope is not lost yet, however, as our cameraman protagonist has an inside man still at the company who is acting as an internal spy, gathering more photos and tapes on the events occurring. He would later show up with a tape called Dorsal Extraction, to which we are then shown. On this tape, it is revealed that they were attempting to cut him out of the suit, which doesn't sound like a good idea at all with all things considered. No one is sure if this is going to work, but we see as a, hopefully professional, enters the cell and begins to approach Godzilla suit man. We hear what sounds like a giant saw being used, but shockingly enough, our Godzilla suit man was very cooperative, but apparently it didn't hurt him at all. What's frightening is how at the end, it said that the results were fantastic. While this would normally sound good, I don't have much faith in this production company to be making ethical decisions, considering all their previous ones have been pretty awful from A, keeping the damn guy alive, and B, continuing to profit off of this horrific situation. 
I am not sure how fantastic things could be, as right after, it is told to us that the camera flash hurt Godzilla Suitman's eyes, which prompted an attack. The end of the century gives us a good slideshow of images captured as he was being chased down by our suit monster. Anguirus Suit, 1956 I have been very curious as to the state of our poor Anguirus friend, and it doesn't seem like he's having a good time. Just like us, our cameraman protagonist really wanted to see this tape, as he also wanted to know what happened to the guy in the suit. The tape we are then shown tells us that the studio had been trying to work with the Anguirus suit like they do Godzilla Suitman, but he is persistently not cooperating and it is hurting the company's finances. It appears that he does not want to be seen by anybody in his newfound state, and who can blame the poor guy? The tape ends there and our protagonist is baffled at how short and how little information is on this tape. But luckily, our spy gave us a bit of an explanation. The production studio, like Good Samaritans, want to make yet another movie with these creatures. The next movie was supposed to be another brawl between Godzilla and Anguirus. After multiple attempts to get Anguirus Suitman to cooperate, all efforts were met with failure, as this guy did not want to do anything for them. You can even see an image that they show off of them probably just doing horrible things to this guy. Which honestly, if I was Anguirus, I'd start biting limbs off. Unfortunately, it sounds like the studio is just going to use more forceful methods to get him to do the movie, but it looks like in the meantime, they have an alternate path to take with another film in the works. Godzilla fighting a giant moth. Oh, I feel horrible for the person who may end up in that suit. Rare Newspaper, 1964. Final Entry. This entry begins and we immediately learn our protagonist cameraman wants to get away from this whole ordeal altogether even going so far as to leave Japan, but he knows he would probably be arrested if he tried, explaining that he has gone way too deep into this rabbit hole, too deep to ever get out. If you thought things couldn't get any worse, think again, because during the filming of their next film, the Godzilla Suitman escaped. Funny story as to how our cameraman heard about this, it was on the news, and according to this newspaper image, he has certainly grown in scale. I don't know what kind of cell they expect to hold this guy in now, we flash through various quotes from people claiming to have seen this Godzilla suit roaming around. One guy traveling wanted to take a nice photo of the road on his way back and caught this on one of his pictures. How this didn't result in an immediate accident is beyond me. We later hear from a kid who saw the monster's silhouette. Thinking it was Godzilla, he ran outside to grab photos. This kid is much braver than I will ever be, I'll tell you that much. We flash through each of these unsettling images of Godzilla Suitman just standing in dimly lit areas as he stares at you. The kid explains that he had watched the movies with his dad, hence how he knew it was Godzilla. And because of this, he knew that the thing he saw was not Godzilla. He describes it as a man wearing a suit. I don't know how he could come to this conclusion given its newfound size, but it is interesting to think that it still hasn't fused enough to hide the fact that it's a weird mesh of human skin and suit material. The kid describes the face as always changing, even providing a drawing as to what one of his faces looked like. Have fun sleeping tonight. Obviously the movie studio found out about this very quickly, and their cover-up was that it was a promotion for the new movie they were working on, and also kept the story from printing on any further papers. Our camera guy protagonist lists out his questions. How did he escape, and was he able to be caught? I have the same questions too, but all we get is an image of our good pal Mothra before this entry ends. I do not think this series is over, as it appears the creator is still actively posting, which is quite exciting. I normally get to these things too late. What a fascinating series to start up. My expectations were that it was just going to be a part of the in-universe Godzilla lore, but once I found out about its true story, it finally struck how this could actually get under my skin. This has done a fair amount of mixing between analog horror and body horror. Granted, we don't see a lot of the body horror, but it leaves it up to the imagination to think about how these bodies had to morph and mold itself to the suit. It leaves a lot to think about the future monsters that could be introduced and how awful it must be to become one of them. I feel bad for poor Anguirus. I hope he gets a happy ending. But this isn't the end of our Godzilla analog journey just yet, as we have one more series to cover. The Suitmation Trials. This one is the one that gets recommended to me a lot when it comes to Godzilla analog horror, so I am very curious to see if I will be needing a change of underwear after I am done with this. Instance number one. Our first entry gives us the context to our story a little bit. We are following someone who wants to go and get back into the Godzilla franchise, starting with the original films. They thoroughly enjoy the first film and give it some positive ratings, but it's when we get to the sequel, Godzilla Raids Again, where things get weird. I'll just show you what they showed me. Ah! 
After Anguirus glitches out, we are then just met with this still frame of who I can only imagine is Godzilla staring directly into my soul and speaking to me directly. If I'm being honest, just staring into those dead eyes while the threatening text asking me if I'm alone comes on screen is doing its job at being quite unsettling. We begin to go closer and closer until we have a hard detailed close-up of his eye before warning us that we are not safe anymore before the tape ends. And that's how our character's copy of Godzilla Raids Again cuts off. They decide to find the source of this messed up tape because they have a bravery that's outmatched. If I saw a messed up tape like this, I would burn it and repress the memory of it. Instance 2. In the second entry, our character explains how once they put in the movie for a second time, the film played past the part it glitched out at, so this isn't a busted tape he had found. He explains that he has watched this movie before on this very same tape with no issues. Only now are there weird messages starting to display. Unfortunately for our viewer, the movie does not go past the part it messed up on prior, but it goes into something much more sinister. During the fight with Godzilla and Anguirus, right when he chomps down at the neck, the screen glitches and text rapid fires across the screen. Too fast for any of us to read, but don't worry, I got you. None of them knew. The snap was my favorite. The cameras kept rolling. They thought it was part of the scene. They had no idea how much I loved feeling his body turn limp in my jaws. Oh fuck. This is definitely having some similar content matter that the last series had. Maybe I can headcanon that Unknowingly and Suitmation take place in the same world, considering it seems like this exact instance happens in that series too but just told from a different perspective. The film plays for a little bit more before our Godzilla friend reappears and continues to stare into our souls yet again before making his comments. He says that he does not regret killing him and that they will bury what they cannot afford to solve. This studio doesn't want any obvious legal troubles that could come from this ordeal. But the next thing he said really piqued my interest. This screen will not contain me forever. You know that, right? The threat literally existing on the other side of the screen. I feel like that is what analog horror is all about. Let's keep moving before I get ahead of myself. Instance 3. This one begins and our character tells us that his latest discovery is more cryptic nonsense and he still doesn't know what to make of it. But let's take a look with him, shall we? The tape starts out with an image of Godzilla standing in the middle of what looks like a big pool of water, talking about how he could never forget his first dip into the pool, the cool waves on his skin, and that it was a much more peaceful time in his life. I'm glad Godzilla has some fond memories even he can look back on, except he looks out and tells us that he was never alone there. We then get a rapid flash frame of an image of what looks like kind of a human skull inside something else, but I'm not too sure. If this is in a similar vein to the last series we talked about, I wouldn't be surprised if this is some strange actor and suit blending nonsense. Text very quickly flashes on screen saying, they're all still there in the cold. They deserved it all. And you're still in the woods. Do not forget that. I really am like the main character in this series. I have no clue what to make of this just yet. Based on the previous two entries, it wouldn't necessarily shock me to find out that this is once again actually about the actor in the suit. I mean, it only makes sense, right? He talks about the camera still rolling as the other actor or costume's life went limp in his jaws. Is it a guy in the suit this time as well? Or is it a more humanoid lizard creature that they are utilizing for their movies? We see the same production company get mentioned here, hinting at their involvement being sinister yet again. The next entry is Immersion, translated from binary code. This one is a little hard to make out. We begin on found footage of someone walking through a forest. Uh-oh, could this have anything to do with these woods we were warned about earlier? We start cutting between that footage and what looks like an array of Godzilla's eyes. Someone made a comment theorizing that this is actually all the little holes put throughout the neck of the suit so that the actor inside could see through it. This would make sense if the story we are following has to do with a crazed Godzilla suit actor going about his antics, but what would his motivation be this time? After we see the eye holes, we are met with another scene that is difficult to make out. It appears as if through a hidden room, we see a bright light flash through a window where it looks like the frame glitches out a bit after. From what I have read from comments, it appears that the main theory is that this is Godzilla escaping his televised cell. In the previous entries, we did see him say that he won't be contained behind a screen forever. He also made mention that he knows the viewer is looking for him. Let's look at that last entry and see if this makes any more sense. Sent. Final entry. This is the most different from the entries to say the least, which is why I kind of really like it. We begin looking out on a nice snowy landscape before we cut to a dark shot of a knife lodged into the ground. We occasionally cut around to footsteps in the snow before a character comes into frame and pulls the knife from the ground. It kind of looks like blood is on the snow from where the knife got picked up, 
but the last thing we see is footage of the forest passing by as we drive through. This series seems to be heavily theory reliant, so I'll try my best here to explain the main theory and also how I just interpreted things. So the way I see it, is that the guy in the Godzilla suit, or the mere entity of Godzilla itself, caused a ton of problems on set, aka killing Anguirus in this story and thoroughly enjoying it. This series' Godzilla oddly seemed a lot more sinister, which is why I question whether or not it is just a guy or if we are dealing with something far worse. It appears that the production company somehow found a way to keep this creature locked up behind screens or in these tapes, and this creature was able to use that to communicate through broadcast to our main character. This seems a little outlandish, but this is actually pretty standard for analog horror from all I have seen. I actually like that this one tried to connect it to the analog part of analog horror, which is nice to see. What we see closer to the end is this entity escaping the television, causing our lead to go on the run, so to speak, to keep away from this creature who knows he was looking for him. Something I really liked about both of these series is how it was analog horror, yet it delved a lot more into classic creepypasta where a lot of its story was text on the screen that you just had to read. And then we would transition into that visual fear and see some of the stuff that the text was describing. It helps build the tension and anticipation for what lies beyond the next frame. At this point, I'm glad they didn't try to go in-universe with this, because that could have gotten a little messy. Not to say that these two analog horror entries are shining examples, but it really does shine a light on the capabilities that these creators have with the small array of tools they have access to. To be able to generate a lot of fear to an audience with minimal amount of room to work with is very impressive, and I commend a lot of these analog horror creators for managing to succeed in that aspect. That's going to be about all that I'll be covering today. I will have channel links to these guys in the description. I highly recommend going over and showing support and checking out whatever else gets put up in the future, and by all means, continue leaving recommendations down below on horror content you'd like covered. It doesn't even have to be analog horror, but without dragging for too much longer, I will see you guys in the next upload.